the awkward first couple of seconds of a stream where the person's like looking into the camera and wondering if things are working. What's up, folks? It's Steve Holmes here, live from Los Angeles, streaming live from the drum room. We're going to play some drums. We're going to talk drums. So now's the time. Post those questions, post those comments, and uh, let me know how it looks. Let me know how it sounds, uh, if there's any issues and whatever. We're just going to have some fun and just kind of play it by ear. All right? Um, whatever happens, happens. So thanks for hanging out. We're going we're gonna to try to start a little slow tempo-wise today, just to kind of spell out like what's happening drumming-wise. Stay on the grid, keep it nice and slow, keep it clean, and of course we'll end up subdividing and getting busy at some point. We'll see how long we can wait before we get there. Um, anyway, let's do this.
Yeah, just trying to keep it slow. You know? I think there was a couple of brain farts in there. But uh, I just want to check the comments, make sure everything's sounding okay. Um, yeah. I guess if it sounded horrible, folks would be saying so. I certainly hope so. Um, let's see. How did you develop ECM style jazz playing? I don't know what that is. I mean, I know what ECM is, um, et cetera. Um, but jazz playing for me was just, it's just jazz playing, you know? I did a whole video on that. Um, helpful tips for jazz drumming or something. I forget the name of it. Um, but yeah, my, my approach to jazz was no different than anyone else's really. Just basic independence against the swing pattern, you know? The thing is like with, with jazz drumming, with a, with a lot of different kinds of drumming actually, you know, folks, folks do what I call like checkbox practicing where it's like if someone says, hey, get, get basic independence happening. By basic independence, I mean I can play different subdivisions with my left hand and my feet against the swing pattern. And by swing pattern, I mean ding, ding, a ding, ding, a ding. Um, and that's it. Like once people do that, they're like, okay, check. I can do it. <laughs> I never need to work on it again. And that's, that's kind of where, that's kind of where the downfall is because um, once you take on something like that, in my opinion, it's like a lifelong commitment. Because what's the alternative? It's like, okay, I don't need to work on this anymore. It's, it's the best that it can be. Um, and that's, that's not the case. Like that, that, jazz drumming in particular, it's a lifelong commitment. There's always room for improvement, always. Um, and so just being able to play things with your left hand, you know, uh, against the swing pattern is, is not, that's just, that's the prerequisite. <laughs> You know, um, there's other things like, you know, dynamics between limbs, you know, getting it feeling good, you know, and I know that folks use that phrase a lot, like, hey, wh you know, what, get it feeling good, like, what does that mean, you know, like, specifically, and I don't have the answer to that, but I can tell you that, it, like, in my opinion, like, the more relaxed something sounds, then the better it feels, you know, as opposed to sounding, like, stiff. Um, and this is not like 100% be all end all, obviously. Every, every answer has an exception, right? Like maybe you want to sound stiff in like an up-tempo setting or something like that. Like I don't know. But the point is like you want to sound relaxed and in order to sound relaxed you have to be able to do it really well, right? Like, like specifically like the percentage of effort it takes to do whatever it is you're doing. Like if something takes you like 80% effort to do it, like you can barely do it, it sounds like that sounds like you're playing at 80% effort and that sounds like you're trying really hard and it sounds stiff as opposed to like something that you can do like with ease it sounds like you're doing it with ease and so then it sounds relaxed um, not to mention that the 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 less effort it takes to do something you have the rest of your brain to focus on other other things like dynamics and how do I sound in relation to the rest of the band how do I sound for the current venue I'm playing where are we in the form of the tune like other stuff there's so many things to think about when you're playing with other musicians that I've always wanted to be like okay I want the drumming to just take care of itself so I practice enough to where when we get to the gig it's like okay I don't have to worry about the drumming so much because there's so many other things to worry about right and so that's what I mean when I say like it has to be relaxed and feel good Let's see what folks are saying. <laughs> That's how Neil Peart always sounds when he plays jazz. Yeah, Neil, you know, he 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 really dove into the jazz thing, man. He he really, I, I respect that that commitment and that attack. You know, he he uh, he really attacked that, um, and I always thought that was super cool. Um, uh, sound great, and the camera is good. Thank you, Lavish D. What's up, Lavish D? Is back. Uh, great to see you, buddy. Uh, Ray, uh, Raymond Bayless. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Jay Geese. That sound is great. Okay, cool. So we're cooking. I've uh, been practicing flam rolls with the bass drum right before the flam. Yeah, that's that's a good one, man. Like that that opens the floodgates. Um, bass drum before the flam, and the key with the flam stuff, like you know, is you know, like I, like I keep saying, um, and of course I'm going to be repeating myself. Sorry, I keep looking at my stick. Like check out this stick. This thing is going to break like any second, but it it's a good feeling stick, you know. So like I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to ditch it yet, you know. Like it, it just feels good in my hand, but it's totally going to break. Um, 
Yeah, if you play like a left-handed flam, which means you're playing both hands at the same time, kind of, the left hand is, is after the right, so, right, like my left hand is, is following the right. Um, and that little bit of time that the right hand has as a result of being first gives it like a little break, and that break is just enough to like start playing the double, you know? And so that's really the key, in my opinion, for a lot of this kind of, you know, flam rolly kind of, you know, elveny, weckle, like whatever you want to call it, you know, just like a flam followed by like a flowing roll, you know, like um, that's the key to that stuff, right? Um, and let me see, let me see if I can jumpstart some of that. And if I arrive at something that I think is helpful, then I'll slow it down, you know? You know, and that's not, I don't consider that like a, a paradiddle, like a, you know, a, a, a para paradiddle diddle, like whatever the sticking is, like right, left, right, right, left, left. Like I don't consider that like because the flan takes up one note, you know, and so I don't consider that right, left as two different notes. It's like, it's one note, but I'm like, I'm opening it up. I'm all about opening up the flams. Like some of anyone that's seen any of my videos, you know, that's the case. It's all about opening up the flams, getting them sound like fat, like that meat and potatoes, just sloppy fat thing, you know? Um, and again, like, getting control of this so it's all in time, but having control of how it sounds in time, you know? So putting the flam on the downbeat, putting the flam on the upbeat, and just kind of, basically just kind of keep those doubles going and put the flam like wherever you want, you know? But again, like on the grid. And I'm not thinking about all those little doubles. What I'm thinking about when I do that is like a blah, a blue, a blah, a blue, a blah, a blue, a blah, a blue, and bah, right? That's, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and so you want your hands to get comfortable doing that stuff and, and you may have heard like at some point like I put a symbol in there like that I think that sounds hip like when you play a flam with like an open symbol it's like you know <laughs> like chta, you know it, it again it takes up the space of one note I don't consider it like two separate strokes but I mean I could be wrong about that but I kind of don't care you know what's important to me is like how it sounds and me being in control of how that sounds and that sound being in time You know, Weckl was really the guy like in the 90s that was doing that all over the place. And I got to admit, like, I really, really loved that kind of phrasing, you know. Uh, man, electric band, inside out, uh, Eric Marienthal, crossroads, uh, acoustic band, you know, like he was doing it all over the place. And I just, I had no, I had no earthly idea what the heck that was, but I just thought it was the coolest sounding, sounding thing ever, you know. It was like the ability to almost play like these whole notes or half notes on the drums, which is ridiculous when you think about like how staccato drumming is and how, you know, initially, you know, especially if you're into rock drumming and stuff, like this was big for me, like when I started getting into drumming and for me it was all about like, you know, uh, I'm a child of the 80s, so it was like MTV and, and then I got into progressive rock like Rush and Yes and Van Halen and, you know, all the 80s stuff, you know, like Men at Work and, and all that drumming is super cool, but it's all very staccato. It's all very baga 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 baga. You know, there's no, there's no like flow to it. Even like with the Rush stuff, it's all, it's all very, <laughs> you know, it's all very staccato. Staccato means short, right? Um, and so once I heard these other drummers, that had kind of this flowing, you know, these waves of notes going, that just blew me away. Um, and I really like that stuff. Uh, and I think that's one of the benefits too to playing like with ghost notes, 
you know, like during Groove, I mean, I, I, I play Ghost Notes too much. I mean, I've worked on it so much that it's just like automatic pilot and that, that's just not good. <laughs> Because playing something because it's on automatic pilot is not really a good reason to play something. It needs, you know, you want to play something because that's what you want to say, um, not because that's just what happens, right? Uh, and I'm totally guilty of that. Um, but yes, just being able to play flowing phrases on the drums, I think, is is super cool, and so that's why I'm like all into that stuff. Um, let's see what other folks are saying. Uh, what's the best way to practice fast sixteenth single-handed groove on the hat? says Raymond Bayless. Raymond Bayless. Uh, best way to play a fast 16th single-handed groove on the hat. Man, there's really no shortcut for that kind of thing, except to say, like, take out the hi-hat part of that and just get good at, like, fast 16ths. And when you, face six, when you say fast 16ths, like, you're just talking about singles, really. Fast, sing fast 16th single hand. Oh, single-handed, sorry, I get it now. Single-handed, all right, yeah, that's the Muller technique. Right? Like you're talking about this. Single handed 16ths on the hat, he's talking about. I think that's what you're talking about. 16s with one hand. Um, oh, Olin. Man, Olin's saying, what's up? Olin, what's up, buddy? It's good to see you. Um, thanks for hanging out. Uh, we're talking about playing 16th notes with one hand. And you know, the example I did was kind of fast. And, and I know that's unhelpful. Like, I hate when you go to drum clinics and stuff, and you ask someone something. And they demonstrate it really fast. And they're like, is that good? Um, it, it's not, so I'll, I'll slow it down for you, because there's a couple layers to this, which I think is kind of cool, actually. Um, I'm using the molar technique. The molar technique is, is very common. Folks talk about it all the time. Um, the molar te technique saves you from having to play each stroke individually, right? Because your hand's going to get super tired. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I don't really consider myself like an expert on like the textbook version of this kind of thing. Guys like Tommy Igo and Dom Famulero, they're like the, they're kind of the, the vault masters of that stuff, if you will. Um, I just kind of took it on and I, and I know what kind of works for me, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's this. It's basically like if you, if you want to get two strokes out of the molar, right, you do a downstroke and then you bring, and then you, you kind of bend your wrist up, you bring your hand up, and when you bring it up, you get another stroke out of that. Right, so you're actually getting a stroke out of the up, out of the upstroke. Right, so it's like down, up, sorry, the talkie mic's on, so this probably sounds really bad, but you know. And so you just, you just want to kind of do that, like, honestly, this kind of stuff, like when I'm watching TV on the pillows and stuff, like for decades I worked on this stuff, right? Um, so I'll just start slow, and I'll do two, and then you can get three strokes with the same principle. It's like downstroke, and then you get two additional strokes on the upstroke, right? So it's a group of three, right? So you can do groups of three, you can do groups of two, um, you can do groups of four too, I'm sure. Like, but but that that's the point. Is like your your hand turns into this circular motion, right? It's like this circular flowing kind of thing where you where you're kind of like. I don't want to say throwing your hand down, but you're kind of like doing a stroke, and as you as you bring it back, you're getting additional strokes as you come up, right? That's that's the principle, right? So maybe I should just shut up and just do it.
you know, we've talked about this kind of thing before. So that's me doing like, you know, one, uh, whatever, like just mixing up like groups of three, three and two, right? Uh, and for your left, for your, for your left hand, if if you play match grip, that's just exactly the same thing, right? Uh, if you play traditional grip, the, the motion's a little different, and and I won't get too much into that. Um, but it's the same thing. It's like it's like a downstroke, and then you know you kind of bring your hand in for two additional strokes. Um, but the cool thing is, is when you put these together, right? Um, and you start to get good at it, you, you can kind of like, it really helps your singles, you know? And we'll get back to playing the groove on the hi-hat. That's the point is like, I don't want to be specific about like, hey, 16th notes on the hi-hat, like, no, no, let's open it up. Like, this is about playing si like fast notes with, with one hand, right? And the good news is that applies to everything, not just the question, which is 16th notes on the hi-hat, right? We'll get back to that. But for now, like, check this out. So that's the same principle, it's just played, you know, it played s sped up on each hand and I'm just using that, you know, uh, to play my singles. Like, let me slow that down really quick. Okay, so I feel like that kind of checks that box, right, in terms of showing, you know, the molar technique and, and to answer the initial question, like that's how I and pretty much most other drummers uh, play fast 16s on the hi-hat. Um, kind of the advanced thing after that, because again, talking about the checkbox, like the checkbox practicing that people do, it's like, well, I can do it. I don't have to work on that anymore. Like, how about playing ghost notes underneath the 16s? Right, that's tricky because now we're stacking notes. Right, we're not we're not playing linearly anymore. We're doing the opposite. Right, linear means means like one note at one time. Right, in different combinations. Like the opposite is like you start stacking notes. Right, so to get those ghost notes soft underneath the hi hat notes and maintaining you know the backbeat being loud, etc. Uh, that's kind of cool. Like this this is like the Dennis stuff. Like Dennis is the master of this stuff. Dennis Chambers.
so that's what I mean with the ghost notes underneath, uh, underneath the 16th on the hi-hat, right? We're talking about playing 16th on the hi-hat with one hand. Um, and we went over the Muller technique, and now we're talking about like playing ghost notes, playing ghost notes underneath the hi-hat during that, you know? Um, which I think is pretty cool. I, I feel like I've stumbled onto some different things with that that, that, that I kind of like. Uh, and I forget what they are, but I, I want to see if I can kind of find them again and then talk about them. Um, just doing different combinations of, of accenting, like, you know, odd things, like every fifth, sixteenth note, you know, with the bass drum and with the backbeat and, and all that kind of thing, uh, all the while keeping the hi-hat going. Like, that's the thing. Like, once you develop the independence and things things become more second nature, then, you know, you're 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 going to want to start to improvise with that. That's just the natural process for like most musicians is, you know, as soon as you learn a thing, your mind will start to feed you variations of that thing. Uh, but you have to be careful not to jump to those variations too soon. You know, I, I know people that do that. It's like, no, I want to make sure I can really do A before I continue to B and then C and then D, et cetera, right? Um, because those variations are always going to be there. And if you jump to them too quickly and don't practice the first thing enough, then that's bad in the long run, okay? So let, let, let me mess with that a little bit more and see what we stumble onto. Okay, so there's a perfect example of what I was talking about earlier. Like it took me like 80%, 90% effort to do that thing at the end there. And it started to sound like it. It started to sound stiff. The notes started to get like disconnected. It started to feel like the wheels came off. It's because I haven't practiced that enough, right? And so that's a perfect example of that. You know, we talked about how much to practice something and not doing like, well, I can do this, check off the list. Like, no, you always got to work on it, you know? And I think that's a cool idea, like, you know, 16ths on the right hand, but groups of three 16ths on the left hand, which is, right, every third 16th is a, is a dotted eight. It's four against three. It goes over the bar line, right? So I'm like, digga, digga, jagga, 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 all the while keeping the 16ths going, right? So I feel like that answers that question pretty well. 16ths uh, on one hand, okay? Uh, before we get to comments, I know inevitably someone's asking about the gear. So really quickly, these are these are Yamaha PA, PHX drums, the Phoenix drums. Uh, the bass drum and the Tom Toms are. Uh, I love these drums. These drums are amazing. The snare is a Noble and Cooley snare. I don't know what kind of shell it is. Sorry. I'm not really a gear head. I'm, I'm does it sound cool head. That's, that's what I am. <laughs> uh, symbols are Zildjian. This is a uh, Azuka on the left here, Latin multi-crash with some sizzles. This main crash here is a 16-inch custom session crash, a K, 
custom session crash. This thing is a little stack. It's a Zildjian trash former with a splash underneath of it. This thing is a, a custom EFX splash. It's a 10 inch with holes. This ride is my favorite ride ever. It's a custom dry light ride, 20 inch. Uh, over here, we've got a 15 inch A custom crash. Uh, it actually has a couple of sizzle holes in it with no symbols, with no sizzle, sorry. Uh, and I just like it because it's very quick. You know, it's got a big crash, but it gets out of the way quick. So it's good for smaller rooms. This, this symbol's no good for like big venues. And back here, actually, let's show you guys the symbol because it's never on camera and it deserves it deserves its own moment. It's a custom special dry crash 16. Check out the symbol. All right, this thing sounds like a china, but it's not, it doesn't have the, the abrasiveness, the kind of like, you know, that thing that chinas sometimes have. Um, but I love, I love this symbol. And, you know, the Azuka kind of sounds like a china too. Uh, and so, you know, these two together, it's like, these are my chinas, but, but they're like finesse chinas. Um, okay, uh, if anyone's interested in supporting the channel, uh, you can leave what's called a super, the little the smiley face icon or the little dollar sign icon. We're trying to get some more cameras and lights and eventually we want to hang up some curtains. I feel like we've got the audio dialed in pretty well, but we really need to up our camera and lighting game, <laughs> you guys. So if you want to help uh, support that cause, you can click on the super sticker and like leave, a, leave what's called a super comment um, and uh, make a digital donation that way. Um, so thanks very much. All right, so let's go back. I feel like we talked about 16th with one hand a lot. Uh, so we're going to go back and see what else. Uh, thanks for hanging out, you guys, by the way. Uh, best way to practice fast 16th. All right, that's where we left off. Um, you guys are still talking about Neil playing jazz. Uh, Giergo Borla. Yes, Giergo is one of my favorite guys ever. What's up, Steve? Miss you, Olin. Yes, we said hello, Olin. So glad you could uh, you could chime in. I hope you're doing well, man. I miss uh, miss working with you too. Um, let's see. That's it. Thanks, Steve. Greetings from France, Olin. Man, international. Uh, ECM 1970s straight feel, kind of like jazz. Bob Moses, John Chris is kind of playing. We're working on. I'm very open to suggestions, man. I honestly, I. I, I I'm not familiar with, familiar with like those recordings. I mean, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, kind of the straight, not necessarily swung, but like the straight eighth, kind of light, light timekeeping with no backbeat, you know, kind of finessey, kind of finessey thing. That stuff's fun, actually, if that's what you're talking about. Um, let's see, molar technique, we talked about that. You want to get good at molar? Yep. Uh, finger control and combine them? Yes, I agree. Finger control with molar is, is a good combination. Uh, Jim Chapin? Yes, the, the king of, like... <laughs> Jim Chapin was evangelizing this stuff like before anyone. Anyone that doesn't know who Jim Chapin is needs to do like do a Google and he wrote one of the most one of the most important jazz drumming books ever called Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer. Uh, and the stuff in that book, literally when it came out, people thought this is what I heard anyway. Um, people thought it was impossible to play that stuff and he actually had to like tour around and demonstrate that stuff to show that it wasn't impossible because it was basically like, you know, the right hand playing the swing pattern and the left hand playing other stuff, including like straight 16s. And I guess when that book came out, people were like, yeah, no. And he was like, yeah, yes. Um, and I just have a ton of, a ton of, of respect for the pioneers of, of drumming. I just love that stuff. Let's see, Jiggy, for me, I focused on finger control. Yes, f finger's just part of it. And like fingers are, are they're, they're helpful, but the, you can't lean on fingers too much, in my opinion. Let's see, Brock Powers, is Sammy J. Watson in the chat? I don't know, I didn't see Sammy. It's possible I missed it. Uh, Sammy J. Watson is, he's my brother. I love Sammy. Him and I went to Musicians Institute together in 93, 94, uh, and we still keep in close touch. We're very good friends. Um, let's see. Hello, Steve. What's your you practice odd times? Ooh, I, I glossed over that question. It says Fernando. Uh, recommend to practice odd times. Um, if I don't find another interesting question, we'll talk about odd times. Let's see. Want to get good at molar? Okay, Jim Chapin, blah, 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 blah. Let's see, Sam James. If you have the patience to sit in front of a practice pad for at least a half hour a day, yeah. That's the beauty of practicing drumming, you guys. Um, 
it's kind of like dog years. You know what I mean? Like 10 minutes is not a long time. But 10 minutes practicing the same thing over and over, and I mean the same thing over and over, not deviating from it at all, you get a lot out of it. Like you're going to get better at it just by doing it for 10 minutes. And so imagine doing it for like, you know, like 20 minutes, a half hour, an hour, you know? Like if you really put in the time, you can, you can get good at this stuff. You know, I find that, can, I find that encouraging. Um, let's see. Let's see, music player where you can change the tempo. Skip Steph, Nate Smith. Yes, I love Nate, Nate, Nate Smith, man. He's got all this stuff down, you know, the, the ghost noting under the hi-hat, and he's like one of the groove masters. I, and he's got all the modulation stuff down, too, which I really like. Uh, plus, he looks cool when he plays. Not everybody looks cool when they play. Folks don't talk about that, really. Um, James Gadsden, yes. Uh, yeah, I want to say it's James Gadsden on the... Uh, on the uh, Use Me track, but I don't know if that's the case. I don't want to pardon my ignorance if that's not the case, but Bill Withers, Use Me, I think that's yeah, it's James Gatson. Um, let's see, Accurate Before Speed. Let's talk about, um, before we get to the rest of them, let's, let's go into Odd Meter a little bit. Uh, Julian Fernandez is asking about Altered. Altered is, you know, kind of in limbo right now because the bass player lives far away and pandemic and stuff, but I was just thinking last night, that I really miss those guys. I really wish I was making music with them. Let's see, let's see, Will Evertson. Will, from House of Drumming. What's up, brother? I find the looser you become in the wrist that relates to fulcrum a lot with the come naturally with patience. Yes, I agree. Um, being in time and playing like loose <laughs> is, is a whole thing. Whoa, some people are, are, uh, uh, are donating here. Let's see, Mark Finley with the 10 bucks for the Bludge to videos. Mark, thank you so much, Jay Gee with the two dollar donation thank you um you deserve a lot more attention on youtube hey spread the word guys i really appreciate the donations i feel like dr disrespect you guys know who he is he's like a famous game game streamer like video games uh the ten dollar donation he's like a wwf guy of video games i love dr disrespect um okay thank you very much for the donations i really appreciate it um let's see hey steve 80s child here so still trying to work on rudiments into my playing can you give me some tips Yes, get a teacher. That's my tip. Um, because being self-taught is only going to get you so far. Um, there's only so much, no matter how talented you are, unless you're like one of the exceptions, unless you're like the buddy rich of your generation or these guys like Gergo who don't, you know, like they just, they just do stuff, you know, and, and practice, 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 live, 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 drumming, 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 and then you become amazing. That's fine, right? But for us mortals, <laughs> like my brain can only go so far. You know, I was self-taught when I was young. And I figured out some of the rock and roll stuff. But once I start getting into the jazz and fusion stuff, I, I didn't have the ability to figure that out on my own, you know? And so you need external sources. And it's different now with the internet and YouTube and stuff, you know? Um, and so there's, you know, you can kind of teach yourself without a teacher with, with, with watching videos and stuff like that. And if that works for you, fine. But the point is don't limit yourself by excluding external sources. You know, um, especially nowadays. That that's that's my advice with that. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, well, it's good to see you, brother. Uh, all right, let's let's go back. Uh, we were talking about odd meter, um, and I am no, I'm no master of odd meter, but I I, I I can play decently in seven and a little bit in five. Um, and the thing I discovered about odd meter is there there are there's specific odd meter things. Right, different approaches. Like for example, the book that that helped me was this book called *Even in the Odds* by Ralph Humphrey. It's an older book, um, and Ralph was teaching at Musicians Institute when I was there in '93, '94. Uh, and Ralph is he's one of the he's one of the odd meter greats. Like he played with Frank, he played with Frank Zappa. Like him and Chester Thompson double drummed for Frank Zappa. Um, I want to say in the '70s. It could be the '60s. I'm sorry, Ralph. <laughs> um, but yeah, just getting the Zappa gig is like that. That means you're from now on one of the masters. I see that the video is chugging a little bit here. Sorry about that. Um, but getting back, yeah, that book it talks about like you know breaking things up into groups of two and three, right? So if you have a group of five, I'll do like two, three, right? And a group of two will be like you know right, left, and a group of three will be like right, left, left, uh, etc. And seven would be like two, two, three, and that kind of thing. Um, and that stuff was helpful for me, but what was more helpful uh, was approaching an odd meter in the same way that you would approach playing in four, uh, in terms of like, you know, 
if, if someone were to ask you about something that you can do, like if you're comfortable playing in four, and a beginner drummer came to you and was like, hey, I'm trying to practice playing in four, and like play for you know four bars and play a fill, and then play for another four bars and play a fill, right? So the approach to that is the same thing for seven. You know, like you start simple, um, you make sure you can play a groove in seven, make sure you understand what playing in seven is. In this case, like we talk about playing seven, eight, right? That's the time signature, you know? Uh, the top number is how many beats are in the bar. The bottom number is, and this is the one that some people don't know. Uh, the bottom number is what kind of note gets one beat. So if we're in seven, eight, that means one bar is comprised of seven eighth notes as opposed to seven four, right? Which means one bar is seven quarter notes, right? So come up with a groove in seven eight, and if you can't, then, then take one of your go-to grooves for four, because a bar of four four is eight eight, literally. It's eight eighth notes in a bar of four four. So if you just take away one of those eighth notes, you're now in seven eight, boom. So you take a, a groove that you like in four, and you play it in seven, right? And what really helped me with this, this is important, is I programmed a drum machine uh, in seven, uh, and it played, you know, whatever, uh, you know, a click or a groove or something. But the point, point was, I put a ton of emphasis on the count of one, right? Like I put like claps and cymbals and bass drums and cowbells on one, and so one was really loud in the drum machine. You know, it was like ding, 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 right? That's what it did, and so. I would rely on that. I would turn on the click, and I would I would play soft so I could hear one, and I would let that loud one count guide me, and I would just play a groove in seven, you know, um, and I hate to say it, um, but that Weckle Island Magic song kind of helped me with this, you know, um, so like a slow groove in seven, like dun dun da chicka dun sta da, dun dun da chicka dun sta gach one two three four five six seven one. Three, five, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, da, chicka, 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 right? Like, get that going here and here, before you even play on the drums, right? Before you even play, because it has to happen internally before it could happen externally. So you want to have some idea of what you're going to do. So turn on a click in seven uh, on your phone app, your metronome, whatever you're using, and don't even play. Just like, just listen to the, how seven sounds. Just listen to how the time goes by when, you're, when you listen to that click in seven and start to sing along, just like you would sing along with anyone else, you know, or with anything else. You know, like when you turn on the radio, you turn on uh, Listen to Me, the radio. Back in my day, we listened to the radio. No, turn on like whatever music you want and just drum along with it in your head. And when you feel confident that you've got something in seven going, then just play it, but do not deviate from it. Make sure you're with the click. Make sure you know where one is. And when you're ready, play a fill. When you're ready, play a fill, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. You know, super simple, uh, and unfortunately I can't turn on a click to demonstrate this for you. I wish, I wish that I could, so you could hear like a big one. Um, and when you take chances, you play that fill, and you come out, and if you hear that big one click that we talk about, <laughs> if you hear it come in a different place, it's okay. You know, that means you just messed up, and like just correct yourself, you know, and, and try to come up with a fill before you even start playing. You know, and, and the reason why I mentioned like playing in four before is because it's the same process. You know, uh, it's the same process for me anyway. Like I'm always drumming in my head, always, always, always. It's like a curse, right? Uh, it's a gift and a curse. Um, but that's how I would start playing in seven. Turn on a click, have it emphasize one, play simple, slow it down, take your time, you know, 
And before you know it, you can start like improvising, you know, uh, because your internal clock will spell out where the time is, just like it does in four, you know. So you could stop playing, and that clock still goes. And if you're playing in four, and you stop and start and stop and start, that clock is still going, and so you know how to come out on one. Uh, and the same principle applies in seven. Except if you do it in seven, it sounds like kind of cool, right? So let's let's have some fun in seven. Okay, having fun in seven. I'm pretty sure there's a couple of brain farts in there. Um, and I tried to spell out the time for you like when I could, which actually screwed me up once. But, but it doesn't matter if I can do it or not. What matters is the overall point. And the overall point is getting that freedom because you have that internal clock going and you know where all the counts are, not just one. Right? So that's. 
That's how you play in seven. That's how I play in seven, I should say. All right, what else we got? Thanks for hanging out, you guys. Really appreciate it. My name is Steve Holmes. We're drumming from, we're drumming from lovely Los Angeles, California. Uh, let's see what else we got. Yes, uh, catching up on comments here. We're reading them on the laptop. <laughs> uh, is watching people play considered self-taught? Uh, if you learn something, sure. The internet doesn't tell me what I'm doing wrong. That's true. Speaking of which, I'm available for private lessons. <laughs> if anybody wants to do like a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing with this setup, then drop me an email, steveholmes at gmail.com. And uh, let's do some lessons. Uh, it'll be fun. And I'll tell you what you're doing wrong to the point of, uh, of drum detect. Let's see, J.E., it's easy to find a bad drum teacher, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. I have every Hudson DVD ever. Uh, again, that only helps if you can put it to use. I have Virgil on VHS. Yes, so do I. But the Virgil stuff is like, I don't know how, how helpful it's going to be. It'll be helpful. Virgil's helpful. Good teacher. OK, some folks are still talking about teaching. Uh, best way to play, I mean, is to find a fun song that you can play along in odd time. Yes, Jay Gee, thank you. Um, just doing it to the metronome isn't great. That's a great point, actually. If the goal is to play music, then find a song in odd meter that you like, that you enjoy playing, that'll help spell out the time. Um, and play along with it. That's a great point, actually. I should have mentioned that. Uh, let's see. I consider watching drummers. Okay, blah, blah, blah. take five is a great tune for learning at five. Uh, skip step is in 17. Yes, finding musical examples. Totally agree. Thank you. Um, I should have mentioned that. Thanks, JD. Uh, let's see. Drum detective. Been playing drums since. All right. You guys have a little conversation. We're going to skip over that. Let's no more Sting with Vinny. Yeah, Sting with Vinny. I mean, 10 Summoner's Tales has a tune in 7, a slow tune in 7, that has another tune that's in 7 and switches to, to like a country 4. Um, uh, it's great. And then the following record, Mercury Falling, has a tune in nine, which is the, a remake of a tune, uh, I Hung My Head. Uh, great musical examples uh, all around of Odd Meter. Uh, let's see. Internalized quarters become, yep, internalized. It's all about internalizing. All right, skipping ahead. Let's see. Steve Holmes, can you try that? Jeez. Jay Gee is saying, can you try that? <laughs> Uh, if that doesn't come naturally, it's a good area for you to practice. Uh, endo one, one e enda in seven. Yeah, I'll have to go back to that. Um, I'll first figure out what you mean, and then I'll see if I can do it. And if not, I'll work on it. Uh, another great way to learn. Oh, let's see. Sorry. Um, learn odd times is to count them out as you play. Yeah, that's kind of what I was doing when I was playing. Have you ever thought of drumming online school or better than Mike Johnston? Well, Lavish D, I appreciate the compliment. It's not a contest. There's a lot of great drummers out there. And I have a lot of respect for Mike, actually. Um, he was one of the first guys to, to really get traction with the online drumming thing and have like drumming weekends and, and, and actually bring folks to his facility. And he has his own facility. And, and uh, and he, he was, you know, he's at Modern Drummer Magazine for that stuff. You know, it's crazy. You know, um, I have a lot of respect for that, uh, for his success with, with the drumming school. Um, let's see. I think you went to four a few times. Yeah, Jakey. You're the guy sitting in the audience in the clinic, like, with his arms folded, right? Like, that's me, too. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I also have some sound. Okay, so someday I hope to afford a drum lesson with you, Steve. All right. Tempting. Tempting. Jay, come to the dark side. Take a lesson. You can tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Except, anyways, uh, let's see. Sound of music. Porcupine tree. Great song. Oh man, porcupine tree. I hung out with Gavin one time from Porcupine Tree. Him and I had breakfast in Hollywood because you know I have houseofdrumming.com. It's a pretty famous drumming website. And so him and I corresponded. He was like, Hey, I'm coming to town, and we did a hang. And man, such a cool guy. Such an amazing drummer. I love his drum sound. He's one of these guys that like that. His drums always sound amazing. They always sound the same, right? Um, and that takes a lot of effort. You know, he's got a great, he's got a great, uh, great drum sound. Um, let's see. 
Prasad says hi. Hi, Prasad. Um, all right, so I guess uh, I guess I'm going to play a little bit more. I think we're all caught up with the comments. Uh, my name's Steve Holmes. Thanks for hanging out, you guys. Uh, we're going to wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, if anyone wants to make a donation, uh, if wants to support the channel, hit that super button, uh, the the smiley sticker or the dollar sign, whatever you prefer, and you can post a question, and we'll give that you know we'll give that question its due. Um, so. Yeah, I'm just going to play a little bit more, and then I'll come back and see if there's any questions. And if not, then I guess we'll wrap it up. All right, thank you for hanging out, you guys. My name's Steve Holmes.
All right. Trying to find different themes, arrive at a different theme, stay with the theme. Try to prevent your hands from running out of gas, which mine did a few times in there. You start to turn on the speed, man. I'm not a young guy anymore. <clears throat> well, thanks for hanging out, folks. I think that'll do it. Let's see what else uh, folks are saying before we take off. Reinforcing the previous message. I'll read this after the fact, Jay. Okay, and I'll uh, maybe we'll talk about it on the next one. Um, let's see. Right hand rhythm stays constant. All right. Frederick Sherman. Hi, Steve. Nice drumming. What kind of drum sticks do you use? Regards from Sweden. Um, let's see, uh, Frederick. I love Vader 5Bs. Uh, and I'm not a Vader artist. I came close. <laughs> I came close. Um, uh, I corresponded with them a couple times, and we started talking. And there was really no reason why I didn't go through, except I, 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 I uh, I'm not like touring all the time and stuff. And so I actually don't need a, like boxes and boxes of sticks. But man, Vader Five Bs, uh, I love. So Chad, if you're seeing this, let's let's talk. Vader Five Bs, love them. Uh, okay. That'll be it for this week. Who knows when we'll be back. This is all unscheduled. Uh, so thanks for hanging out. My name is Steve Holmes.